Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 44th episode of By the Bywater. Great to be back with you all. We're going to have a lot to say here, so why don't we talk about some personal news first? Why don't we give a big uh, cheer, round of cheers to Oriana for two great things that have happened uh, for her? Because one, she's about to do a move to a new spot, and two, she won a thing. She won. Yeah. She's, I'm, she's I'm got a stuff. Tell, tell a little more about this. I'm just a finalist for some script competition that I wrote. The I wrote a pilot script while having COVID. Is it's I think it's called the Blue Sky Comp. And anyway, I'm I'm somehow a finalist for this, which is really nice because they, they give you money for being a finalist and that's fantastic a plus <laughs> highly recommend so you know wow a nice thing happened we get to move to portland uh in in one week after recording this i am yeah. so excited and we will get away from all the noise that's been plaguing my recordings <laughs> <laughs> for this podcast there you go so if you do in your background noise that kind of might be what's up <laughs> the usual thing we'll do our best to sort of you know mask and hide it if it comes but but yes oriana is moving north to portland so now i'm the southern anchor uh, i believe the southern <laughs> anchor of the of the team and all that and in case people are wondering I said it before, there may just be incipient plans to finally do an in-person Three of Us episode at some yes. point here. Not not anytime soon, not like in the next couple of months, but it's in the works. That's all I'm going to say. Mm. So uh, more on that when it happens. And uh, yeah, we're all, we're all just uh, going through and selling in. And yeah, we have, oh, oh guys, folks, it's it's been, <laughs> you've seen our post. You know what's going on. You know what we're here to talk about. But we do have a little bit of news. So let's just simply <laughs> go with that. So, Jared, as always, <laughs> tell us, tell us what's up. Well, the Rings of Power has completed its first season, and that's what the rest of the episode will be about. Yeah, but it's also been reported that the second season is now currently filming in its new home base location of the UK, part of a wider decision by Amazon to centralize its studio work outside America in that country. There's been various pieces in Variety and the Hollywood Reporter talking with the showrunners about plans for that season, and we'll have we'll have more to say about that. Mm. But as of this point, the tentative plan for its release won't be until fall of 2024. Okay, um, <laughs> coming up a little more swiftly. However, is the planned November 15th release of the latest archival collection of Tolkien's work published by HarperCollins, The Fall of Numenor. However, as we reported earlier in the year, the unionized staff at HarperCollins have been organizing for a better overall contract and have overwhelmingly voted for an open-ended strike beginning on November 7th. Now, obviously, we can't force your hand, but we're all planning on honoring that strike and won't be purchasing the book until this is resolved and ask you to consider joining us. Indeed. indeed Union you strong. Know. Union Unions strong. are so important, everybody. Very, very. You know, I will say my own personal bit of nice news is that our union just ratified a very lovely new contract. Uh, I, I could go on about it, but I've got a little extra money coming my way, too, and also just, you know, further building for years down the way. And so, you know, and uh, Jared, I know, is, you know, the Got his team and things like this, and Oriana should have yeah. the union of Oriana. But anyway, so the point you is, you know, I would I would have joined the WGA if I had been staffed on a show. Yeah, yeah. So it's vitally important. And look, the thing is, you know, if if it's resolved by November fifteenth, great. You know, heck, mm -hmm. you know, we'll we'll share out news of that uh, on our Twitter account the more we know it. If they do on strike uh, on the seventh and it keeps some time, there you go. So we know what's coming up. We certainly would love to talk about it, uh, but uh, you know, there there are things we'd rather stick to so yeah, we, we, have, we have priorities here we have our priorities straight by the bywater yeah. i like to think <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we do our best and various other authors and writers i saw uh, charlie jane uh, anders has uh, joined in uh, support of the strike and uh, more besides so uh, we know this is not a uh, an unheard of sentiment shall we say so again at the point of this recording the strike has not happened yet uh not due for another couple of weeks so we will see what happens and could be by the time even the episode comes out it will have been resolved uh, in which case be partially outdated but uh yeah so just do keep that in mind even as it is very very tempting to get this new book because certainly it's been tempting me but 
We will, <laughs> we will wait and see. There is time. Mm-hmm. So with that said, yeah, that kind of clears decks. It's time to reflect. It's time to go in. <laughs> and it's, it's time. We, 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 we tentatively talked about it last time. We've certainly been posting on our Twitter accounts, but Oriana, please lead us into the subject of this, this episode this time around. And here we go. Well, so I want to start by acknowledging that making television is hard. It is something of a miracle that any TV series appears on your screen. Hundreds of people have to do all sorts of things, ranging from the technical to the ephemeral to bring any story to life. And it's even harder when you're adapting work from a different medium with an extra, extra degree of difficulty for prequel type adaptations. Which is why it is so frustrating when all of these talented craftspeople and artists work is in service of a story that is fundamentally unsound. And that is what has happened with Amazon's $750 million adaptation, heavy air quotes there, of The Lord of the Rings. And we are going to talk about all the ways in which we believe the foundation of this show has failed everyone involved in its making. First, let's go back and talk about, I guess second, let's go back and talk Mm -hmm. about adaptation for a moment. Or really, the art of adapting in absence. The J.J. Abrams acolytes running Amazon's show are not adapting The Lord of the Rings. They aren't adapting the appendices either, really, because the only stories in there about the Second Age are a rough timeline of events and some stuff about Celebrimbor forging the rings of power. And this is the first real sin of the show, and one that I haven't seen too many people talk about, which is Amazon did not purchase the rights to Tolkien's writing that dealt with the First and Second Age, because they were not buying rights to fulfill a creative vision for a show set in the Second Age. The show, as pitched by the Rings of Power showrunners, did not exist until after Amazon had already spent $250 million on the TV rights to The Lord of the Rings and Appendices. Okay, but only having the rights to the Appendices did not need to be a death knell for the show. There's incredible thematic richness to work with here. You've got anchor characters like Elrond and Galadriel. You have the opportunity to create your own new beloved characters like Celebrimbor, Lord of Erigion. You have the dwarves of Khazad-dûm that we don't know too much about. You have the entire island of Numenor to explore. You have new fascinating villains like Arpharazon. And you can create and deepen characters that will draw people into the world and works of Tolkien. You could even have cast non-white actors to play important elves like Celebrimbor or Gilgalad. <laughs> Maybe we could have had some South and East Asian representation in Middle-earth. We, we didn't really get any of that. Instead, the show is really an adaptation of the prologue of Peter Jackson's The Fellowship of the Ring, as written by a funhouse mirror version of J.J. Abrams. At least that is <laughs> what it felt like to me, and I think Ned and Jared agree. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, every episode of The Rings of Power f- seemed to have to include multiple references specifically to the Jackson films, ranging from specific shots to full-on stolen lines of dialogue. The writers insisted on over-explaining and over-motivating while not actually constructing a cohesive narrative. And perhaps the most cardinal sin here is writing for the audience instead of the characters. The show attempts to kind of create its own lore in ways that feel forced and frankly silly at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are brief moments of promise, uh, and we will talk about those, but Mm -hmm. those moments are promptly swamped by inexplicably bad choices. And so we'll get a lot more specific. I have laid out some of my big beefs with this show. We all have our bugbears. Ned and Jared, tell us a bit about your main issues with the series, and then we can get into a little bit more of a granular discussion of how this entire show does not work either as an adaptation of Tolkien nor as a TV series. Well, Jared, you want to go first? I loved it. You know, the the diverse cast, the female-centric storyline with a messed up timeline and like helping a guy who may or may not have his own agenda. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of Amazon's other original series, Undone, which is incredible. Um, this show sucks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's bad. I, like, it's like, what? Where we even go from here? Like, I've been tweeting about it. If anybody was paying attention to those, but like, it just is messed up from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Almost. Mm-hmm. I mean, it starts. I think promisingly for like 15 seconds where Galadriel is narrating going, nothing is evil in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And that's like, yes, strong thesis, fantastic, mm-hmm. fantastic thesis. And then at every turn, it's like, actually, you know what? People just suck. Like orcs are bad. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to judge people based on their birthright at all times. And it's has nothing to do with the theme. Like nobody is learning from this. And I don't, I think it's just bad writing. It's not like they're sitting there in their prejudice not learning and we're supposed to learn from that they're Mm -hmm. just like no actually you know what orcs are always chaotic monsters and that was we'll probably get into the handling of orcs but like Mm. there's all these moments where somebody in the writer's room is clearly thinking about what this story actually means and then every other voice around this person is going "Mm, you know what we need Mm. is some really cringe humor from a a dwarf or whatever like (laughs) or the hobbits or or the hobbits god the freaking hobbits (laughs) Anyway, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Jared's thesis is show bad. (laughs) Yeah, show bad. Don't watch. But also, a lot of people liked it, so maybe we're wrong. We're not wrong. I know. know, It is is weird. I want to pretend to be balanced here and uh, open the possibility that we're wrong. We're really not, though. No. We're not wrong. I'll I'll, I'll advance two things, I think, that can sort of open up discussion. Uh, First is kind of building off uh, Agreed, show bad. And Agreed, undone. Very good. (laughs) Watch it. Um, It's it's incredible. It's extremely good. Uh, I can't can't praise it enough. It's, It's quite remarkable. The thing that I was arguing, especially in a couple of major big old Twitter threads that I posted while the show was running was kind of my linchpin frustration with the show, which Oriana already hinted at. Namely, there is thematic material there that wasn't addressed. My big issue was ultimately the time crunch and how it affected the story of Numenor, because mm-hmm. yeah. as the showrunners revealed, uh, when the first publicity in the show proper happened much earlier this year, they said, yes, we've done this. We've squashed the timeline. And I'm like, that's a red flag. That's a big red flag. And I don't think I ever got over that because I'm sort of like, eh, that's an issue. And I will have more to say about what I think they might have been able to do. Of course, you know, money, money, quarterbacking is like, you know, from outside is, you know, you can only do so much. But my main issue was ultimately that uh, as as the show kept going, I realized they had almost totally destroyed and oversimplify the story of Numenor as a whole. And mm-hmm. this, to get into a big thing right here, can maybe be uh, simply summed up this way. I've seen already a number of people basically uh, saying one way or another, oh, you're so focused on the lore, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. you, you want to have every detail there. Now, as I kept saying in my threads, adaptations adapt, as Oriana pointed mm-hmm. out. You are going to lose things. This is not me. These, the, the equivalent of me saying they didn't get everything they could have done would be the equivalent of somebody who watching Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring would be annoyed that there wasn't the bit from Aragorn in the book saying, talking about the cats of Queen Beruthiel. A lovely detail, <laughs> but that's not going to make the film. Similarly, you know, not everything was ever going to make this, even with the fact that, you know, you have this simplified thing where you're only working with the timeline in the back of the book and some extra details there, is that uh, people are confusing the complaints that I and others had what happened with Numenor of confusing lore with theme. Mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. were not complaining about the details of every little bits going away. We were complaining about the destruction of the whole theme of Numenor, which can be basically summed up as, you know, you could argue the Atlantis story, but let's go beyond that. It's basically Tolkien playing out over a long view of history, which he does talk about, of course, in stuff that the show did not have rights to. But even if you're not going to go through the granular details, you can still do the theme, yeah. which is that over time, Numenor Founded as a refuge, founded as something after a destructive war, founded with the highest of ideals, has, through the process of time, through uh, the growth of Numenor from uh, just an isolated spot into a world-dominating empire, Mm -hmm. has become cruel, vicious, and horrible. It should be, at this point, the timeline something close to the worst place on earth if you're not a Numenorean. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there are ideas in terms of how I think they could have played this out in ways that, you know, honor the lore without having to specifically refer to it. And again, I'll go into that later. But they don't have that. Numenor is this big, empty shell. Mm-hmm. It is... It is it is incoherent as a society. Mm-hmm. It is incoherent as a as a means of story motivation. Um, it is 
stupidly oversimplified. Um, there are <laughs> there are crushingly obvious nods that destroy Tolkien's dictum of applicability rather than allegory. Elf lover. God. Elves are taking our jobs. What? Why does an elf want a job? More on that later. But the point is that this this and this is just one facet of the whole. I should mm-hmm. note is the claim about. But like for me, that was emblematic of the failure of this show. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. uh, is that it had something that Tolkien serves up on a plate. It has a fairly deep thing to reflect about. It's sort of like, what happens when ideals are lost and corrupt with time? What happens when people go far away from enough where it seems like, you know, there, you know, there are ways you can sort of, like, screw up with that. Of course, you, you don't want to necessarily refer to a mythical golden age under the guise of, you know, horribleness, but if you are nuanced enough, you can point out how people will refer back to something like that to encourage horribleness. Mm-hmm. And while the show tries a half step here and there to do that, it does not succeed with it at all. And mostly, it's just like, it's it, Numenor is useless. It is almost totally useless the way it was carried out when it should be something a lot more truly nuanced, really horribly powerful in a sense of a real power and potential threat. It is not. And uh, and every excuse that the showrunners gave for it about being, oh, this season is the prologue, Ooh. more on mm-hmm. that, too. That's the pilot. Just do a pilot yeah. and then make the show you want to make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, here's the thing, too. And this comes back to Oriana's point as well about this, about how the how it started. Weirdly enough, I almost had a moment of going like, they may actually do something right by this because they were able to convey very briefly the entire key crux of the story about the destruction of the trees. They didn't even have to bring up the Silmarils. They mm-hmm. wisely didn't even bother bringing that up because it's sort of like they don't actually need that. Right. And in the space of five seconds, told the story of Ungoliant and you know, Morgoth destroying the trees, this idea, this visual thing about that with Claps, what it meant. And sort of like, wow, they found a way to telescope this show, da- this story down to an incredible bare essential with an incredibly vivid visual moment that actually works. I'm impressed. And then it stopped didn't do that again. And, and that then, was the very well, beginning they, of the first episode. <laughs> then they do bring up the Silmarils and in the in the worst way possible. Oh yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really quickly, speaking of that moment of the, the trees and all that, that is all in the like the prologue of the of the pilot, mm-hmm. which uh, or first episode's not really a pilot. They they do and it's a fantastic visual, you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And then they go and ruin that. Almost immediately. <laughs> and then and then the and you know, Galadriel's narrating, she's like, So then we chased Morgoth across the sea to get the Silmarils back and like avenge like t- clean up evil or whatever over in Middle Earth. Mm-hmm. And it's like I know they don't have the rights, probably, to what actually happened with the, the Noldor leaving Valinor, mm-hmm. but the show treats it as the elves are good. Yeah. Yep. They are good. They are on the side of good. What they do is good. They come to Middle Earth to solve evil, mm-hmm. and then that's why they're hanging out here is to fix everything. When really the backstory here is that they are screwing up. They <laughs> kill yeah. their relatives to get the ships to cross the sea. Mm-hmm. They immediately mess stuff up in Middle Earth for the elves that are already there. Mm-hmm. They are engaged in a long, fruitless war because they won't say they're sorry. Like They mess up consistently, but the show does the thing that Jackson kind of does too, but more so where they conflate elves with the side of good rather than mm-hmm. a complicated people in their own right, mm-hmm. which flattens the show out so much. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. And part of the, the, the Abrams acolyte thing that Oriana mentioned <laughs> is like continually hobbling the show here because everything has to be a freaking mystery. Yes. Yes. Like Numenor, so much, so much goddamn screen time is taken up with the, like the, heavy air quotes mystery of where the king is and what he's actually doing and like why muriel is the queen regent Useless. which is not even that's not a thing queen regent means you are in charge princess regent is what she actually is her father's not dead she's not the queen yeah. she's the princess yeah. she's the princess regent sorry i really <laughs> that drove me nuts every time they called her that and i was like you don't have to call her by that anyway but like every every single plot element is a is a mystery when it doesn't need to be. It is written for the audience. It is not yeah. character mm. based writing. It is audience based writing, and it yeah. is all over the show. The entire show and is just that. Yeah, there are huge, huge plot elements that the the show wants to land so badly. Like mm. in the, the episode where Mount Doom finally erupts, like that should be <laughs> devastating. Mm-hmm. Like not mm-hmm. just literally within the world of the show, but to the audience, that should be like, oh my god, this everybody's screwed now. This Mm -hmm. is causing so many problems. But because the plan to do that isn't revealed until like five minutes before it happens, you're not invested in what's going on. You're just like, oh, I'm just hanging out with these characters. And like, that's fine. 
like a hangout vibe is fine, but this is like if Father of the Bride had Mount Shasta erupt, <laughs> like right in the middle of it. Like there's, it's such a swerve from what's been happening. Yes. Every plot element is like that. And that is terrible writing when everything is a mystery, when you could build tension, mm-hmm. you could have actual like rising action, climax, denouement, kind of like basic storytelling stuff. And not every story has to be told that way. But that's the kind of story they're trying to tell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They are clearly going for catharsis, like traditional, like not Lynchian montage of whatever. They're really trying <laughs> to build. They're so afraid you'll figure out yes. what's going to happen yeah. that they won't give you any information. And it's a nightmare. It makes every episode so frustrating. There is zero reason to write the mystery of who is Sauron. Yeah. We None know who's Sauron. <laughs> at all. It doesn't add anything thematically. It screws everything up, even. Like, what is he doing in the middle of the ocean? Like, spoilers, I guess they're all over this episode now, yeah. I guess. He's he's Halbrand. He's a sailor Galadriel encounters in the middle of the ocean after jumping off a ship to swim back to Middle Earth, which, Ooh, you know, boy. whatever. 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 She just happens to encounter him, and then they happen to encounter the Numenorians, and then he goes to Numenor and just kind of hangs out, doesn't even try to screw anything up there. No. And then they go to Middle Earth, and it's like, he, at no point is Sauron actually doing anything except being along for the ride. And that's like... Like, you know, clearly they're like, oh, well, he wasn't always evil. And it's like, no, well, okay. No, he doesn't but, repent but, but at like, this point. He isn't. Mm. What does he do? And there's these shots. I think the thing that, like, really, really, one of the things that bothered me the most about the, the Sauron reveal is that mm. one of the, in the episode where, you know, we've been in Numenor for, like, three episodes and absolutely nothing has happened. And they finally <laughs> go, they're finally going to go to Middle-earth. Oh, my God, a thing is happening. And Hal Brand is, like, putting on, you know, he's getting dressed in the armor. And he specifically places the pouch on the table, the pouch that has the crest of the king. Oh, yeah, no, that, this is when he's like, he has said he's not going to go. And then he's, he... not gonna, he's not going to be their king, whatever. And he, he puts the thing on the table and leaves. And we hold, the shot holds on the pouch. We don't follow Halbrand. We hold on the pouch. And Halbrand, like, clearly decides in the moment, oh, well, yeah, I'm going to take this. No, I'm actually going to go. I'm actually going to go and take the, and I'm going to take the king thing. And it's like, why would he do that? He's Sauron. Why would, why would he, who is this for? Who is this shot for? And that kind of thing is all over the show. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a, it's an entire pile of red herrings because they just don't want you to know what's happening. When how much more interesting and like horrifying would it have been to know that he was Sauron from the beginning and get a sense of what he might be up to? Like maybe his actual plan could be a mystery. Like we know it's going to be the ring, but you know, the characters don't know. And he could be like a, like, he's like a snake in the garden in Numenor. Like, you could, you could work that so well. We aren't well. the only people watching. Like, there are plenty of people. My husband, you know, it was really invaluable to have his experience of the show as a, as a, pretty much a normie. Um, <laughs> you know, he doesn't know anything about the second age. So, you know, he was down with the show. He was like cool with the show for a few episodes. And then he was like, Oh my God, nothing is actually happening. Like nothing, happens. nothing is happening. They are wasting my time. Why is this a mystery? It's days of people trying to convince each other to do something. That is the entire show. Yeah. Jared, was it you or Ned? Was it you who was like, no one feels as though they have an inner life. It's like when they are not in the scene, mm. I can't imagine them existing. I think all of us have said that at some <laughs> point, but yeah, these, these characters, like when they're, the actors are great. I yeah. Mean, no shade giving, to the they actors. They are giving the illusion of there being actual characterization, which is, I mean, great. Mm-hmm. But when they're, yeah, when they're off screen, what are they doing? Like, Elrond does not have, when he's with the dwarves, which is another issue is, why is Elrond, why is Celebrimbor shoved to the side? Mm. It's literally he... just nostalgia. People think that the showrunners think that you want to see Elrond doing everything. But like, no? I mean, looking at the Star Wars prequels, I loved Qui-Gon Jinn. Like, yeah. he rules. He's not there for very long, but he gets to do stuff and he's not a character you already know about. Mm-hmm. Like, you could have you could have Qui-Gon to Celebrimbor, as it were. Mm-hmm. Maybe, like, better. Yeah, but please make, still. It, make him better. <laughs> Look, <laughs> make him I mean, more I'm on the record as a prequels defender to a certain extent, so I... I don't think they are fantastic, but I think that actually they managed to do something better than the show. Mm. Actually, I think you're right because it is a vision. It right? is a vision. It is wonky and it's not necessarily. But it well does executed. have an idea. 
mm-hmm. it has an idea and it is a very similar idea like the rise of evil yes. in a place that mm-hmm. is not equipped to handle it and it does it so on the nose and everything but you still are like you have a sense of what's happening and here it's like just it's anything it could be happen at any moment when they get to the southlands and there's this battle sequence that makes no sense and everybody <laughs> all the people in the southlands are like oh my god our king we love our king and there's no context for it mm-hmm. they're just like oh hell yeah we're here to be ruled by somebody we love this at no point up to then do any of the southland characters express a wish for a king to return they don't talk about there ever having been a king as far as i can remember if the, they do it's like for like one, one second there's, um, <laughs> the reference or two yeah theo's crappy friend who is racist to aaron Deer mm-hmm. says something like yeah when the king comes back and it's like what why would why is this child like it? Why is this child into that the idea? Been so interesting in an applicability versus whatever. Like mm. have have like the really nasty human characters be like, you know what? We kind of want autocracy here. Yeah. <laughs> and then have it be like, oh no, maybe this isn't great. Maybe it would foreshadow too much, but still it would it, yeah. give a sense of these people, like who wants a king back? Why do they want a king back? And why where does the king even rule from? R- also, right. like, this, mm. it, it doesn't seem to be a real kingdom. And also, like, you the problem is you do, you aren't contrasting that with anything because the elves are portrayed as having this very rigid mm-hmm. monarchy where everyone, even Galadriel, who is supposed to be like pretty autonomous is commander is, of the northern is, armies is a <laughs> like you know has no power in the face of gilgalad and it's like that's not how it that works it, you ha- they had the opportunity here to reinvent mm. and imagine a society that is not as hierarchical as we are used to mm-hmm. yeah. and mm-hmm. they just didn't they just they j- it's it's a total failure of imagination Right. Yeah. There's room for, because Tolkien never really explicitly spells it out. He sort of, he acknowledges, again, Silmarillion, again, not rights to, but again, thematic things, mm-hmm. that Gladriel had uh, grappling with the idea of power. And, of course, that's yeah. one reason why mm-hmm. the speech in LOTR is so as powerful as it is, both yeah. written and filmed. But it's conveyed very poorly. And, indeed, the you could say the plasticity of uh, Elvish hierarchy, especially after the First Age and the yes. Second Age, where things are much less organized as such, would mm-hmm. allow for this sense of, you know, there is no central nexus. In fact, the whole idea, going back to, yes, the lore, but let's think about this, is that when Sauron as Anator, and I have my issues with oh, that God. whole line yeah. being dropped, frankly, but let's set that aside. As Sauron as Anator comes up, it's not like he, it's like, you know, he doesn't he doesn't win over Gilgalad or anybody else. He does, however, win over Celebrimbor, and there's no mm-hmm. sense that, you know, everyone's like, you know, Celebrimbor is like, has to be exiled from his position or whatever. Right? He just simply goes where Celebrimbor is. And, and we mentioned him a couple of times, this is a case where nothing against the actor, but the character was incredibly ill-served. In fact, a fiery younger, frankly, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Celebrimbor Brimbor, somebody who had some real sense of not merely whatever grabbed us, but that sense of this burning energy that yeah. derives yes. ultimately from someone like Feanor, who is his uh, great grandfather, if I remember right. Um, I think just is, grandfather, actually. Uh, yeah, great grandfather. You're correct. You know this idea that uh, that a spirit of like you know Feanor's you know artistic reach, but also drive, desire, and ultimately downfall. You know comes translated into him and how he deals with uh, with uh, Sauron. Absolutely fascinating to have that, you know, approached yeah. on screen one way or another. Again, you don't have to worry about, because you can't, concluding specific details from unfinished tales from the scatterings that we have, but you can simply use that as kind of a reference point going like, okay, how can we develop that? And instead we have a well-meaning older defense contractor who suddenly mm-hmm. comes up with the with the idea of how they decide it's going to be a ring and it's like there's there's room to create your own story but when you do it such a botched way it's so yeah. depressing well, that's part of the you know the thesis of the show being nothing is evil in the beginning what it's trying to do is show you all these various polities and entities and people and whatever starting in a state of grace and falling which is very Tolkienian, and I think that's part of why people are like, this feels like Tolkien, because it says that it feels like mm-hmm. the show is telling you that it feels like Tolkien. Yes. But what it's doing it's is nothing like that. You don't if you got to see the fall of Numenor, even in a compressed timeline, that would be one thing. But what you're seeing is a Numenor that's already 
mm-hmm. flawed. Mm-hmm. It's already doing, like, literally the line, elves are going to take our jobs, is in there. Like, it's already paranoid and messed up. There is no... There's no sense that it's starting in a place mm-hmm. of good. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, I mean, it, there isn't a sense of it being anything, but it's certainly not. <laughs> yeah. It's not like utopia that is now becoming dystopia. It's just a thing that's there. Mm-hmm. The elves are already arrogant and insular and think they're in charge of everything. When you could have, I mean, in, in the lore, and it, I think this is this is in Lord of the Rings itself, so you could, you could absolutely use this. They're trying to heal the world. Mm-hmm. Here, it's more like they're afraid of dying, which is yes. also, like, we could get into that, but like, oh, boy. but in this context, having a Celebrimbor who's, like, young and, like, yeah, I want to, this world has, still has problems. It's been thousands of years since the fall of Morgoth and things still are messed up. Mm-hmm. We have a chance to fix something and then showing how even, like, a really good mm-hmm. effort can be perverted when it's coupled with the quest for power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, you could, the Southlands could be their own own thing they like are trying to claw their way back from being allies of Morgoth, which is its own. Like he was way that on was the other so side of the continent. Yeah. Why were they? <laughs> but you could have a similar, not the same plot line because that would get really boring. But they are trying to get out of like a fallen state and into grace. Yeah, and the elves aren't liking them, which is an entire other thing. But like there are so many points where the show is clearly trying to follow its own thesis, and mm-hmm. when it does, it's in the worst way possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for the most most of the runtime it doesn't like even Killebrimbor is like literally a defense contractor what is yeah. they call him like the foremost weapons manufacturer in middle earth or something like that which is like are you trying to get me feel feel bad for raytheon like right? what? <laughs> it, <laughs> what is this it's absolutely the choices to make you know galadriel warrior princess instead of, you know the only way we can show a woman in power is to ha- is to give her a sword that is the only way that these mm. people can conceive of of feminine power, and it's absolutely infuriating. But also, you know, choices like sidelining Celebrimbor, Elrond, you know, the weird babble fish that happened. Elrond is described as having been the herald of of Gilgalad in the in the you know last in the days of the last. He calls Hawaiian. himself that. Yeah, he was, I was like, the herald, and, and it's like. I don't know if they just didn't know what a herald is. I've had some experiences There's in so the past. There's so much research they did not do on basic terminology I here. Have, <laughs> I have had experiences in the past with other writers and executives not knowing words. <laughs> and I wonder if there was some babblefish thing happening where it was like, herald, um, d- speak, speaker, speech writer. Elrond <laughs> is a speech writer now. <laughs> and instead of having something like Elrond, if you want to show Numenor through a long period of time, starting from a state of grace and falling, you have a character who is immortal and can go and visit Numenor. And I know this is not. Who has a reason Who to. has a reason. <laughs> and he goes and he visits his brother. And then he goes away and he comes back and, oh, my God, my brother is dead and I didn't even know. And, like, so you can show this alienation. You can show, like, how elves are different and, the you know, and start, mm-hmm. show, start to show this rift where, like, you know, none of the Numenorians outside of Elros got a choice in their mortality. Mm-hmm. Elros chose for them. And you can see, and you know, they're twins. Elrond and Elros are twins. Have them be identical twins. Have Elrond, looking forever young, come to the shores of Numenor to visit, waiting too long in between each time. And each successive time, people are like, wow, you sure look a lot like our dead king. This sucks. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you get mm-hmm. to live forever. We don't. Then you have the beginnings of a reason to f- for Numenor to feel so alienated from the elves. Mm-hmm. You get you plant mm-hmm. that seed of wow, this sucks that we don't get to live forever. Mm-hmm. This is what we mean when we talk about the foundation being unsound. Right. Because it's it's easy. It's easy. You can come up with all of these ideas in two minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that that fear of death and the the necessity of accepting death mm-hmm. is a huge part of Tolkien yes. and it's a huge part of Numenor's issues. Mm-hmm. In the show, they're going for an extremely on the nose, like this is the rise of fascism, I guess, kind of thing. <laughs> and you can't like there's space for that. You could totally sure. do that too. But they don't seem to have any problem. Mm-mm. With death, there aren't any giant tombs that I could. I mean, mm-hmm, maybe there mm-hmm. are, and they're just not called out as such. I don't know. They're not fixated on death or anything at all. They're just there as props, so Galadriel can have an obstacle getting back to Middle Earth and hunting Sauron. 
what is like again with the fundamental pro like why is galadriel's motivation hunting sauron why is that so we were talking about this a little bit and like the show is like oh he killed her brother like sauron killed everybody's brother you're not special no. galadriel <laughs> but there if they want her to be a warrior princess and i feel like i'm okay with that more than you are yeah I, I, that's, that's my like, own little bugbear um <laughs> Because we do have Tarmuriel, who's, like, a princess and in charge of stuff. Like, there's a, a control female character, as it were. <laughs> um, well, we could, you could, Yeah, like, you could motivate her looking for Sauron in a way that's not, like, I've been doing this for, like, 6,000 years at this point, and he's just, he's, I'm not any closer to finding him, which is, what? Bana- that's what the You're show is doing. You're bad at your job. <laughs> yeah. But also, like, there are so many ways you could have her be a commander of an army and give her things to do like why is she the commander of the northern armies why not the southern armies and then she has a reason to care about the southlands in a way that the show doesn't in the show it's just like i guess sauron's going there she uh, she has no reason to even know anything about the southlands at all and yet she appears to be an expert when she's in numenor yeah yeah um, like she could again, commander of the Southern Armies. This is like her turf. She has to get back here. She feels like it's threatened. Like if you want to keep motivating her to do stuff, like that's a just that change is enough. But also at some point, this is so funny. It's not until like what the seventh out of eight episodes that you learn she has midway through episode seven that she has a husband who's missing. Why is she not looking for him? That would be so easy. It would be so easy. And and like then she could have that makes it even more. Like, understandable why, let's say she has just a band of volunteers, even, who, yeah. who mm-hmm. you know, served with Celeborn, and yeah. and even they are ready to give up at this point, and she's like, I would never give up. Like, I, if my husband disappeared, I would never for a second stop looking for him until I died, until my last breath left my body. Like, it is biz- utterly bizarre that Galadriel only mentions her husband in it, that late in the game to a character she has no reason to, to mention him to, <laughs> and it provides no further motivation to her character. Well, and also, yeah, so that whole thing where she's like, she's been looking for a Sauron ever since he killed her brother, which happened in the first age. Like, Early, like she's... Jesus. Like, yeah, this is a very, even for an elf, this is a very long span of time to devote to this one thing when there has been, everybody around her is like, Galadriel, chill. There is no evidence Sauron is back. And she's like, no, I know he is. How? I don't, as an audience member, and this is functionally a new story. This is not like lore here. Yeah. She, like, I don't have objections to this based on, well, she should be doing this. It's literally just, this is what the show is presenting. Why is she spent this long on it? I know I know she's an elf. I know they live a long time. But it makes her seem like a complete fool. Whereas, if it were, my husband is missing, it's been like two years or whatever, like, you know... Yeah. Some, uh, maybe a, a more elven span of time. Like, it's been 500 years or <laughs> yes. something. I don't, that's fine. But he's been missing, and I suspect someone may be back, and I don't know who. And then trying to figure out maybe who it is. or whatever. Then it's a more recent, more immediate problem than, like, my brother died from too much evil, and I gotta complete his quest. Uh, who also, like, Finrod is in Valinor. If she wanted to see him, she could go back. Back to Valinor. Which the show presents as a choice in the very first episode, but, but. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, let me, and that's, let, that's let, the other thing is it isn't actually, uh, I don't recall it ever being presented as like her giving up seeing her brother again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, she's just like, my dead brother's words are coming back to me and advising me to jump off the ship in the middle of the ocean and swim back to middle. I'm not over that. That is such a baffling it, it's bad. It's bad. They wanted to have their cake and eat it, too. They were like, well, we want her to choose not to go to Valinor, which is great. That's great. I mean, since since they're obviously not caring about what Valinor actually is or represents, sure. one True. thing they could have done is have her get to Valinor, see her brother, and then be like, you know, actually, I think I've got something I've still got to do. Sure. And have her give up Paradise again. Yeah. Like, you, that would have been... We get no sense of the stakes of what she's actually giving up. They tell us... Yeah. She's like, oh, I found a, a scary mark on an anvil, and that means evil isn't gone from the world yet. And, like, that's 
That's like, all. Like, what are like, you talking okay. about? <laughs> yeah, and then the mark itself is like a map. Sauron's been Ooh. leaving a map everywhere. This to... is an over-explanation <sighs> mystery box thing. Yeah, yeah. It's so terrible. <laughs> terrible. So bad. <laughs> let, let me throw in and try and actually say a, a couple of good things about this. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because there are actually a few good things. And be, because the problem is, the problem is, folks, the good things about the show stand out precisely because so much around it is terrible. <laughs> and mm-hmm. there are some interesting elements that sort of like the seeds of, gosh, I would have liked to have seen that show that these these elements promise or this this factor. Um, a lot of it has come down to, we mentioned this briefly, we really have to give credit to him that regardless of the source of a lot of these stories and lines, trying not to single out the creative team individually, it, it emerges from where it emerges. But um, <laughs> a lot of the actors do their level best and are very charismatic and good actors to have around. I think collectively everyone agrees that uh, Morphid Clark does pretty well as Galadriel. Yeah. Again, you know, we, yeah. have, we have questions about like you know, character motivation, but she has her own charisma. She's not Kate Blanchett, but she's not trying to be. Yeah, so it's she's it, a younger, more fragile Galadriel, and that's great. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's something. It's sort of like you know, it. She has also achieved the goal of oh, what a, it, she she has to carry the show to a large degree. She <laughs> does so. It's the type of thing yeah. sort of like you know, I wouldn't mind seeing her in other, seeing more of her other work. You know, that's what a good acting performance should do. Mm-hmm. Um, other actors of note that we all agree on. Um, I'll say more. I'll come back to one person in particular. I'm going to loop around here. For myself, I admit, I thought the combination, and I've been saying this for a while, of Ismail Cruz Cordova and Nazanin Boniati was really good. Um, I think the, you know, I can see some people saying that their their slow burn romance was a little too slow burn. I like the idea that they were just holding back because it's sort of like, is this right? And they're just trying mm-hmm. to stretch out the tension pretty well and all that. But uh, I think Cordova, frankly, was very good as a Ron Deere. Um I yeah. think he was he was mm-hmm. a thankless role for a large yes. degree of it. Yes. But um, he has absolutely, he does have charisma. He does have a very sort of good focused intensity. Really liked it. In terms of the Numenor Butch, really almost nobody stood out, which is kind of a problem. Uh, you know, that's just uh, that's it's a kind of own thing. Nothing against you guys, sorry, but I think your characters were just all too well. Um, I like uh, Cynthia Anna Robinson as yes. Tarmiel. Probably I the think best. Probably the, the, the best. Yes, I agree. I agree. Terribly written. She's not given anything consistent to do, but every time she's on screen, she's just delightful to watch. She's, she's watchable, clearly yeah. Yeah, she's trying. She's trying not, so hard with something her that's not supporting that, her. Like, we have no, we never get any real good insight into mm-hmm. who she is, what she wants, like, mm-hmm. who she is outside of, like, her role in society. It's mm-hmm. just, it's always kind of unclear. Like, it's it's just astonishing the extent to which they will explain why Mithril is special in a... When it isn't. When it isn't. Really, it's, but, you know, like it, it's just a good message. Metal, but no, no, now we have to, it has to be, in, yeah. be you know, the Silmaril. But we don't yeah. really explain why Tarmiriel is is good with the 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 elf friends or isn't yeah. or, or becomes like she's one. Hiding or, it, but yeah. It, yeah, it's it's a mess. But she's like, when in the early scenes where you don't really know what her deal is, or like you're not supposed to, not and supposed then you to, actually, yeah. you never really find out, but you know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When you're supposed to be uncertain about her motivations, she's the actor is good enough in that role to make you feel like there is something going on. But you're not being told. She is clearly holding stuff back mm-hmm. in a way that people around her not aren't necessarily picking up on. Mm-hmm. Um, but the audience is, and she's fantastic in it. And this kind of like overburdened, like she's trying to hold things together mm-hmm. by the skin of her teeth because she's the only person who can see they're falling apart. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's great. And yeah. then nothing is, and then nothing else happens. I mean, the, the easily the worst characters were like the the uh, good old Kemen and good old Yaren. It's sort of like, oh boy, literally, I, who? What are they doing there? They serve <laughs> no I... purpose. And the actors are fair at best. I'm sorry, but yeah, no, that was that. No, um, looping back, let's lo- and let's loop back out to this kind of the other two sort of sections we haven't really talked about, except just briefly here and there. So let's on a positive note, let's talk about more about the dwarves yeah. because because pretty much we're all agreed that Sophia Novete as Diza slays. Fantastic. I would see her do anything. She's so, so we... warm, so warm, God. so lively. Yeah, just... and then the the sort of, I don't know if it's a twist exactly, but towards the end where she's almost becoming like Dwarf Lady Macbeth, yeah. but still really kindly, really welcoming is like, wow, I actually care about a storyline in this show? Like, what is she going, what is she actually up to? Is she up to anything? What is going on? A caring for a character invented for the show, even. Yes. I mean, it can yeah. be done. You can add to the basics in a way that 
creates characters where you feel some sort of connection. And yes, and just being able to see, you know, Casa Doom as an actual functioning kingdom, thought they did a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Owen Arthur who plays uh, Prince Durin Rusbin, solid, and that thinks that great. just the sheer the delight of domesticity in a way that is fairly rare, honestly, in Tolkien mm-hmm. adaptations. It's not gone completely, but you know, it's sort of like after seeing a lot of tragic or screwed up families, it's kind of nice to see sort of an actual functioning family unit mm-hmm. at least for a little while there, and in, in light little moments. It's 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 sweet and cute, and even if we take a while to build into what the whole like you know. Elrond uh, Durin bromance is, and that was sort of like, but um, but um, they stumbled into it. Still, you know, that's fine. And so, you know, that was the case where you know we all agreed to, and it's like in those scenes, in the various scenes, moments aside, in the dwarf scenes, we get a lot more. The dwarves are more well served in this story than they were by Peter Jackson's Hobbit adaptation, yeah. which should yeah. not be the case. I kind of disagree. Oh, really? Yeah. I think the show is repeating Jackson's mistake of making the dwarves overall funny mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. bumbling. Mm-hmm. When yeah, that's they're fair. funny they're funny in Tolkien's Hobbit. Gimli is very funny in the books, but in a different way yeah. from the way Jackson presents them and the way the show is kind of presenting the dwarves where they're they're like they're just comic relief. For the most I mean the king the king of Kazadum, I think is doing dwarf stuff really well. Mm, but mm. the way everybody else is written is like, even the, the domesticity for me felt very sitcom and not in like a fun, yeah. like my neighbors, the dwarves kind of way. It's just like <laughs> more than fair. Yeah. And, yeah. So that was, that's my take on yeah. the dwarves. Okay. But, uh, but setting that aside, we've been circling around it guys. The Harfoots. Oh the no. Hole, the Harfoots no. and the stranger. We've got to, can I, <laughs> we got to talk about it. We, did, we wish we didn't have to, but we got to talk about it. <laughs> Obviously we hate them. But this <laughs> yeah. has been bothering me since episode one and I have to get it off my chest. Mm. Their costumes not only are bad and ugly, but why aren't they hemmed? Why are they walking around with unraveling shawls? These are nomadic people who have to make everything last mm-hmm. as long as possible. Mm-hmm. Just fucking hem your shawl. Like, it's pretty easy. I can, I, like, I'm no seamstress. I can hem something. Yes. It makes no sense as a choice that real people would make, especially people in their situation, to have costumes that are on the verge of falling apart at all times with no care taken of them. They aren't even patched. They look so costumey, mm. and I'm so mad about it. Okay, we can continue. No, the, for me, it's the twigs in the hair, and it's like... How much lice is, is, do you guys just all have lice all the time? Is that, is that just a thing? Well, so mm. in, in theory, in concept. They, they gotta be ready to hide all the time. I know. Well, yeah, like I like, but also I like the idea that they like the natural world so much or whatever that they're like. No, you're going to get chiggers. No, yeah, no, t- the way they're doing it is bad. It's obviously bad. But I think conceptually I'm into them being like, I, I wear flowers in my hair, and I'm going to do that. That's just what I do is wear flowers or twigs or whatever. It looks terrible. They didn't do it correctly. But conceptually I can see what they're going for. Again, <laughs> execution's bad. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, and then it's uh, yeah. Let's just say that uh, you know I I had a number of Irish friends who were watching who were not <laughs> thrilled. And this builds on this builds on Jared's point too about how characters, especially characters who are speaking a certain, shall we say, not received pronunciation English, let's say, mm. and all that are speaking in a particular dialect, the pseudo Scottish of the dwarves, the semi Irish of the uh, of the Harfoots, however you want to phrase it, because it is feels like something you know created for it as opposed to you know. Trying Trying to actually represent anything, which you know, I suppose is fair enough. But but there's a larger issue there. You know, the, the, these characters speak English a little funny, as opposed to the more neutral, right. quote unquote, tones of men and of men and elves. And that's that's an issue. That's that's that's, that's yeah. a real that that's something that really can't be hand hand waved. No, yeah, they're coded as as low class, yeah. and mm-hmm. they're given an accent that has been perceived as low class historic. Especially given, you know, the history of English colonization of, and like it could work if it were explicit and like the Numenorians were, if we actually saw Imperial Numenor come Mm. to the shores of Middle Earth and explicitly colonize or drive away people like i it's weird to me that we didn't get a scene of of numenor in all its might landing on the shores of middle earth and driving away the hobbit you know scaring away the hobbits at the very least mm-hmm. um 
I, I don't they understand wanting why. wanting to lead to that. I mean, I can see. I guess. But I, like, yeah, I, I, can see, I can see the showrunners trying to pack in all this type of stuff you're talking about later as being like, aha, see the consequences. But the problem is it it's it's going to feel rushed and off. And, it is. Yeah, and there's, yeah. there's no sense at any point that they're actually writing towards consequences. No, none of it mm. feels intentional. None of it feels intentional. That's the thing. It's like they were like, oh, well, let's just have the, the Harfoots be Irish because – Silly Irish. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hilarious. oh, that that Irish brogue. It's very nomadic, yeah. I yeah. guess. But they're, <laughs> I mean, pulling back from the accents, they're just really annoying. Oh, mm. like awful. as a awful. Yeah, they're, they're awful. Just sitcom awful. banter with a lot of that. Oh, yeah. God, it's so bad. Like their lives are devoted to hiding. Like that is their entire ethos. Even their their big festivals are about hiding, and that's so bizarre to me. Like anthropologically, mm-hmm. like I mean. A, a big feast is going to be on some level an expression of a culture's values, but they're walking through the woods singing about how they're don't walk alone. You're going to get eaten. Like uh, well, while well, leaving their... behind people, by the way, Oh, you'll never walk alone except when we leave you behind because you've got like a, a, a sprained ankle. Boo. Well, that was like, they left them behind because it was like Nori's fault or something. Like this is their punishment is this kind of shunning even, thing, even which I like. That, even before that but... though, because even before that, the the dad's ankle was was messed up so like he was at risk of being left behind i think i'm misremembering the timeline but like nobody walks alone except if you're sick or injured then you can just you know screw you goodbye and well also like there is uh, go the hiding thing and you know the lyric and the song about my legs are so short and the road is so long as a (laughs) short person i am five feet tall you know i think my sister is only like 411 so coming (laughs) coming from a short family i don't see the world as some kind of full of giants place occasionally if i like interact with a really tall person i'll be like ha we should have a sitcom mm-hmm. but the 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 way that the hobbits or the proto hobbits harfoots conceive of themselves as only small yeah they think of themselves in terms that the audience thinks of them i don't think of myself in like cons- I'm not co- like viewing the world constantly through a lens of oh I'm so short except at the goddamn grocery store when something is up on the, the highest shelf then I'm like uh eh. but most of my most of the time especially given that they are so that the hobbits are so isolated yeah among they have themselves. no they have very few frames of reference for something being bigger than them in a way that would make them reflect on their own absolutely height. this is this is it, this is tall Tall person bias. <laughs> Tall privilege. <laughs> Tall privilege is is yeah. rampant. Can we talk about the stranger? Yes, yes. I was about to say. Let's talk about him. Mm. Freaking Gandalf. You know, in a weird way, even though again it was all the whole puzzle box thing, Hura Sauron and all the rest of it. In a weird way, they were trying to bring in something. You know, as with a lot of these characters, weirdly, you know, the less you know about them, maybe the more you can actually like them. <laughs> it's sort of like right. you know, it's more, it's more right. promise until you get the resolution. Definitely the case with the uh, three, the three weird cultists <gasps> trying to follow the stranger, Why? which when we didn't know anything about them was really fascinating. And then we found out it's like <laughs> they were mm-hmm. so much better until they talked. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> really? Why did? <sighs> yeah, they could have. They could have kept themselves more on that in a bit. But uh, but yeah, the stranger. It's it's one of those things that you know. Every so often, they really they. It was it was an interesting case where you have a sense of something of power that is value neutral, meaning because you couldn't tell where this guy was coming from or the sense of elemental forces that they had, it's sort of like it, the question is like, you know, good or evil, the idea of something like power, the power one can has or controls or incarnates more accurately, since uh, ultimately he is supposed to be a Maiar, is something that can be used in any number of directions. And the sense of destructive power that is there in the character when it comes out as the character is trying to figure out what is going on and who in fact the character is, you know, since the self-realization, what am I, what am I being trapped in particular in what is appears to be an incarnate body for maybe the first time ever in its entire existence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like, you know, how do I interact with people? What is, what is even language? Mm-hmm. How do I, you know, do this? And so you'd have moments like, you know, just sort of like, you know, the, the tracing of the star thing in the sky was its own thing. But like, you know, even setting aside the silliness of the fireflies as the light source, 
the image of the fireflies dying as he's trying Great. to do something was yeah vivid. Uh, the image of like the trees leaning in at one point where it's sort of like he's channeling Ooh. something sort of like you know so kind yeah. of brutal. We didn't really get the ants aside from that one scene. Now that I think about it, when the meteor is slashing over, maybe we're getting I mean, in given the second how season. How this show serves every other character? Are you really disappointed? Leave I mean, them alone. I'm not complaining. Leave the ants alone. Really, I'm just simply noting that you know they're going to play that as a point. But yeah, you know you have you have these things about it, and it's sort of like there's something potentially here. And for a while, when it seemed mm-hmm. like it could be, as they were clearly happily happy to red herring, that maybe it was, even though it would make no sense. No solution for the stranger makes sense. Let's keep this straight. No, yeah. for real. Is that by the time it ends, and we have the frickin' always follow your nose thing, it's like, <gasps> God. <Ooh. laughs> Hated that. Again, the thrall in uh, that thrall. this show, this show is in deep it is, thrall it is exactly to the Jackson movies. Like all of the fan fiction that arose in the early 2000s, yep. mm-hmm. that was only about the movie version yes. and not about... It's exactly like that, except work. Mm-hmm. No, the Stranger stuff was, for a while, was really interesting, where they're, try, where they're showing like this being trying to adjust mm-hmm. to being in physical form, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what he is. And it's less interesting to me to have the hobbits there along for the ride, because... Like, they need you need somebody for him to be capable of harming, you know, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But... That is like where he's like writing and trying to come up with words and he's clearly not even sure what he's capable of and all that. That's like really, really interesting territory for for a Tolkien yeah. adaptation to, to mm-hmm, go to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the whole thing about is he Sauron is like it doesn't carry any weight because at no point does he seem actually capable of intentionally harming anybody. You can't choose to be like good if you know it's not a choice if you never had any other option yeah like, <laughs> yeah he's never like he he harms things that are threats to the hobbits but he never even considers harming anything that's not a threat to the hobbits which means the idea of him ever being anything but good is like look we know he's not sauron come on <laughs> yeah it would have been a, a, a quick fix for something like this in the screenplay stage is to just have the stranger integrate him into the southerlings uh mm-hmm. the southlanders <laughs> Have, yeah. have them be his point of contact. Have Th- have Theo be his his point of contact, and then you have the like, oh, someone small and vulnerable, and instead of instead of the extremely racist against the Irish yeah. hobbits <laughs> that are only there because I'm sure that was an Amazon mandate. Like it, you got to have hobbits if it's yes, in Tolkien. Absolutely. I, I, one more thing about the stranger before I, there's not really actually much to talk about him. True, true. It, it, I did like. I will say the touch towards the end, even though the cultists are kind of like really stupid by the end, mm. um, the fact that he's not really himself until one of them calls him Istar. Yeah. Mm. And that he's like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> it, it's like in the Two Towers when he gets called Gandalf and he's like, that's right. And then he like slips into that identity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. that idea of being named as being so significant to his being is like, that was really cool. Mm-hmm. It was in the middle of a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> But it was it was a nice touch. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it when people are thinking about what they're writing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me let me uh, signal out uh, a couple of uh, of moments and episodes in general that uh, you know basically, and this is something we were talking about. Just as as, as we were, trust us, you should see our chats as we were watching all the episodes <laughs> in real time. Uh, yeah, this this is us being calm and controlled. Um, is that uh, first off, uh, they actually did do again. Let's set aside whatever mm, we're in those first two episodes that you know we did not work. But Jay Biona was actually pretty solid choice to anchor things off and. Uh, his, uh, I still think the actual fight scene between Bronwyn, Theo, and the one orc in their house is honestly good TV, good action, terrifying. It's a good combination of horror and action because you got a sense from just one orc being mm-hmm. a completely horrifying, destructive mm-hmm. force that it takes a lot of effort if you're not mm-hmm. a trained warrior to even slightly bring down, if not mm-hmm. kill. And mm-hmm. I thought the staging and the blocking of that was a really good moment. But again, that's another classic example of you get these moments. Mm-hmm. You get these mm-hmm. moments, but they don't really work. Now, another one I'd like to signal out, and a character we haven't really talked about yet, a frustrating thing, is the frustrations of Episode 6. Mm-hmm. Episode 6 was simultaneously the best episode up until that point and the worst nonsensical disaster. <laughs> yes. And the reason why it was the best episode was due to the confrontation scene between Galadriel and the character of Adar, who mm-hmm. once... Once it helped, helped certainly good casting. I forget the actor's name, yes. the guy from Game of Thrones. Um, let's see, uh, you know, Ben something, uh, who, Benjamin. uh, 
That's, oh, that's yeah. the character name. Char- character name, yeah. So he, uh, so so having introduced this Adar character and having him be part of the G R U Sauron mystery again. Let's set that aside. Once Just it gets whatever. more established that he is, uh, you know, a slight riff on the idea of what the Mora Quendi are supposed to be. But let's set that aside. Okay, he's an elf who's been essentially enslaved somehow by Morgoth and like things like this, and he's rebelled against Sauron, and he's you know he's taken at least some of the orcs with him or a number of them, and basically it leans into an interesting idea. Idea, which, especially the less you know about the overarching story, but could work, especially if the character really believes this, is that this character thinks he's killed Sauron and escaped a certain storm of slavery, and as we were all talking about, basically makes a case that if the screenwriters had the courage to, and I shouldn't say screenwriters, mm-hmm. the showrunners, let's say, had the courage yeah. to see through the idea that uh, that uh, these were people who were, in fact, just trying to live. Mm-hmm. This, uh, yes. this elf and these orcs are sort of like, look, we're not trying to be slaves of Sauron. On. And the Adar character, the confrontation in the barn, and again, there's lots of other things around it that are like, what? But the confrontation in the <laughs> barn between Galadriel and Adar were the closest thing we get to sort of like, a, you know, it even works even better as a back and forth between philosophies than anything between Galadriel and Halbrand slash Sauron at any point mm-hmm. in, the, in the season. So it's Galadriel versus Adar there. And his, his argument saying, like, we're all children of the one. We are mm-hmm. all descended from. We have a right to exist, you know. And it's basically also a good argument. And the most cogent one we've seen in any Tolkien adaptation, basically arguing that the orcs are not inherently evil or mm-hmm. might not be inherently evil. And if they had stuck with that <laughs> theme and actually made it land, that would have been a fascinating element element to go through. But by the end of the episode, that's clearly not the case because we've yeah. seen that Adar has actually staged, uh, staged a lot of things to set up the Rube Goldbergian plan to actually blow up Mount Doom. And I feel just stupider for even having to say that <laughs> because that's exactly what happens. I it the, the more we talk about it, the less sense it makes because why does he want to, why does Adar want to make the Southlands in uninhabitable for like, like, cause even for the orcs, Mordor sucks. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I just don't understand why he wants to do this. There are so many, so many ways. The show is so instructive as like an example of things that you could have thought for one second more about and gotten something better out mm-hmm. of. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the orcs, up until that point in the episode are obviously just like orcs uh we're, you know we're killing we're murdering we're gonna enslave people like they're just, and so his argument is like okay man sure right all children, <laughs> like whatever but i mean you could have tweaked a little bit before then so maybe they're only fighting when attacked you know mm-hmm. that kind of thing mm-hmm. etc but then if if they make some sort of agreement to like okay you know what you can have the night we'll have the day it'll be fine we don't have to see each other just leave us we'll leave each other alone because we clearly can't interact without bloodshed that'll be okay mm-hmm. they broker that piece or whatever and then the true believer steals the sword and activates the mountain and mm-hmm. it's like okay everybody's screwed now because some fanatic couldn't let go of the original plan that would have been better. fine better but also <laughs> it's still like why would you have a blood powered artifact that just turns a lock to open a dam to make a mount it's mad Magic. Have the mountain yes. explode because the sword is magic. Yes. <laughs> have him, have him cast himself. Like you know, you have the sword. Have him cast himself into the volcano if you want to. Uh, you know, yet more throwbacks to <laughs> to the Jackson movies. Yeah. Go ahead. In this case, I guess. It's well, I mean, just, since since everything else about the sword requires well. like sacrifice, you might as well have like a human sacrifice. Like that would have been. I think kind of cool. Sure. And then nobody wins because Mordor now exists. Yes. Mm, like yeah. you could have done that or as I think Oriana said in the own Slack, have Mordor be ruined by the long processes of industrialization over and over exploitation. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you had if you are truly treating this first season as a setup, then set stuff up. Like yeah. act, like not just within an episode, but over time have you know, a a group of people, and we don't even necessarily have to see them, to have stuff in the Southlands start to die and become barren, and no one really understands why. Maybe someone stumbles across a lake full of, like, industrial runoff, poison, nasty, you know, slurry, you know, over the course of this season. And then maybe you can have the mountain blow up if you really feel like it. <laughs> like, that would have been a great season ender, honestly. Yeah! <laughs> why not? I don't know. Like, this stuff isn't hard. 
Mm-hmm. I, I, it's just not hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a mishmash that there's like any any one plot development could have been either yeah. better set up or better followed up on, but none of them are. They no, just exist the orcs, in a safe float. Uh, like the orcs in particular, there is this, I'm assuming that at least some of the people in the writer's room read uh, the part of Morgoth's ring where Tolkien writes about the orcs and his, you know, trying to figure out what mm-hmm. they are. Go listen to our orc episode if if we if you want to. And there is this idea in in that writing where it's like, well, maybe this is like Morgoth was like sort of a totalitarian leader in like a, a magical sense and literally had like control yeah. over mm-hmm. all of the orcs. And he's gone, and they're no longer under his control. And they just are kind of funny looking people who are just trying to live. And yeah. then when Sauron, when the mountain blows up and Sauron comes back, there they are again, back this, under someone is, else's like, control. Have, yeah, the tragedy of seeing orcs who are succeeding in the world mm-hmm. suddenly you know? be brought back under domination would have been... Heartbreaking. So heartbreaking. And there's hints of that even in Lord of the Rings when they talk yes. about just wanting to get away from things. It's not something yeah. that's, you know, incompatible with the themes of no. stories. Yeah. And and the other thing, too, the point about, like, you know, the, the activation of Mount Doom through this bizarre <laughs> engineering setup is that... That in a weird way, it really, among other things, goes against what the show is trying to argue because the whole – there's a flashback moment, too, in that series where it goes back to the first episode, which, again, everyone's already mostly forgotten about this time. It's, it's the show handles things weirdly. But the, <laughs> the, the, the thing we get right at the beginning of the show where Gladriel and her team discovers this mysterious, ruined, old, old dark outpost, and uh-huh. there's – whatever's happened there clearly is some sort of magical blood ritual body horror thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you have mm-hmm, literal, mm-hmm. like, you know, orcs who have been, like, you know, flattened and plastic against a wall and stuff that's straight out of something like Videodrome or Hellraiser. Yeah. You know, it's 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 truly grotesque. This is not something or a vent horizon or something like that. You know, we were talking about <laughs> that level of like, Ugh. you know, and you get a sense that this is something created by some sort of magical force or something just beyond the can. You know, it's mm-hmm. all that. It's something like this is really horrible, haunting and terrifying. So to have it go from that and then have this thing being something like, you know, insert sword A into tab B Jeez, is like video yeah. game. Yeah, video like, game. Sc- the thing you I could have th- done that with any old sword apparently because it doesn't have any special (laughs) shape the thing i said at the time is that this reminds me of something in like one of the official dungeons and dragons forgotten realms Mm -hmm. novels from the late 80s or something like that you know (laughs) i would totally buy that in there sort of like oh yeah i can see that yeah that works sure that's a magical explanation it does it just doesn't work here it really does not work Mm -hmm. here it's just it 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 undermines itself it's just so so off and things like that. Well, I'm going to stay. We might want to start wrapping up. We've, we're turning this into a long one, and we might want to, you know. Yeah, we, it was always going to be. We should at least, should at least go as long as one of the episodes because, oh, my God, that's another thing is don't waste my time. Don't give yeah. me 73-minute episodes for every episode. No, no, no. That is season no. finale or pilot stuff. That is right? not every episode stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, come on. Mm-hmm. Restructure your episodes or something. So maybe it's 10 episodes of shorter periods right? or something. Is there a way to do it? You could even do that and have it be stretched out even more, you know. And I, I'll, I'll end, and then you guys should end. I'll end on... Two points. First is, and this is even beyond what, what Orion has been kind enough to sort of show us because we've been getting initial rating supports of the first few weeks, not the full season yet, but the first few weeks, and it's not been the number one hit. And maybe initially, Sugar Rush initially, because of course everyone's like, what is this? But been Evan. And the thing I'd like to say, and I think we were reflecting that, is as compared to, inevitable comparison, but let's bring it up, and as compared to the House of the Dragon right now, there is anticipation, there are memes, there is reaction in real time. Mm-hmm. Admittedly, of course, mm-hmm. that is the difference between HBO being an actual, quote-unquote, broadcast channel in a sense, versus the streaming model, which is you throw it up on a date and then people come to it as they do. And you get a real sense every Sunday night, classically, as always the case with Game of Thrones, that people are watching going ah, da, 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 back and forth. Mm. And it's going to happen here in a few hours with the season finale, but that's already leaked because in some respects there's a huge intense interest in it. Again, that reflects a real sort of driving like, oh my God, I want to take it all in. Whereas there is no conversation about this. Uh, one variety piece, and one of various pieces we'll link in the show notes, even though it was from the point of view that they really like the show, again, not us, but it's basically <laughs> trying to going like, you know, no one's really talking about it. It's mm-hmm. like the the fans, the people who are watching it or pay, would pay attention are talking about it, and that's 
it. You're not mm-hmm. seeing out in the wild discussion. I'm mm-hmm. barely noticing anything except for like, you know, maybe like one person at my workplace and he hates it as much as I do. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of like that's sort of a thing. It's sort of like this is not what you want. The other point I'd like to bring up is let's talk about this in terms of imaginative TV. What did Amazon want? Amazon mm-hmm. wanted something that, regardless of whatever it was, they wanted it to be a series that, you know, built on something that people have very fond memories of. Mm-hmm. They, uh, The showrunners presumably had some ambition of introducing some sort of element of something unique of, of itself to it, to add to it, even as they were doing whatever callbacks they were. And they wanted it to be something that could be you know, maybe a little more family friendly, not necessarily mm-hmm. as Games of Thronesy, which is mm-hmm. very much seen as more of an adult product. Something more broadly said. And the weird thing is, and they also want to be a big prestige and, and thing, and for Amazon's own glory. The weird thing is, there are three series I can think of. There are other ones I can name. Three series I can think of right now that are either happening or about to happen, and all that that illustrate all these points intensely better than the Rings mm. of Power did. It just illustrates by comparison how badly this is botched. One is Star Wars Andor, currently running right mm-hmm. now. An incredible example of somebody who is coming in, a showrunner with, with a track record, <laughs> Tony Gilroy. God. Mm. Doing literally anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As opposed to just the randos, <laughs> you know, someone who comes in who has very much has his own particular thematic interests and, and foci that he's mm-hmm. shown in his own work was already did already stuff because he did, uh, did do what is, you know, they do the work to help put Rogue One together. And then we gave them a chance to sort of, uh, to develop both this character and choose in Rogue One through a backstory, through a prequel, but also put his own stamp on it. You can tell. And my goodness, every episode in comparison to, like for me, Rings of Power was like, here we go again. Whereas every episode ends, there's like, can't wait, must know, you know, mm-hmm. a much better sense of focus, a much better sense of character, the characters who do things logically, things mm-hmm. playing out, how people in different areas across a wide spectrum uh, space, the same way that, you know, Rings of Power is supposed to show people in different areas all reacting to bigger things around them. Those things make more sense. You know, you sense how decisions, how, how you sense how inaction can be as boring mm-hmm. as action. The show has been very, very clever about doing that, about people sort of shutting down as much as like amping up. A rare thing to see. And again, all within the framework of Star Wars. Able to put their own individual stamp on it. Insanely good. Great. You know, again, it's no, mm. com- it, it just, you know, Series of Power is nothing in comparison on that level. Another show, which I, which has already come out and had one season and is Amazon's own fantasy, prestige fantasy show, is The Wheel of Time. Mm. The Wheel of Time is not a quote unquote perfect show. It is, as have a noticeably cheaper budget. Um, so some of the CGI is a little flaky on the sides, but still, it's been able to, in its first season, which again happened last year, Told, uh, introduced a whole bunch of just you know good ensemble characters, set up the basics of the wider story, made changes as adaptation should to make it more interesting and better for TV, as well as working with sometimes dicey you know original source material or mm-hmm. some issues there, which in the same way <laughs> one has to do with Tolkien when you're looking at it. You know how do you do these things? I think has done it generally more successfully, and it's the type of thing where I am looking forward to the second season of Wheel of Time, and I am not looking forward to the second season of Rings of Power at all, except God. with fear and trembling, and the final. Final example, and I'm I would not have said this even a year ago, is that the actual fantasy series I think I'm gonna be incredibly entertained by and just be like, this is a good watch, and haven't seen anything other than the trailers, is the upcoming Willow series. Mm-hmm. The Willow trailers look fantastic. We're talking about something that isn't drawing on a big legendary thing of lore. It's just one movie, which itself is a you know combination of all sorts of fairy tale tropes and all that. But it created its own world, it has its own thing, and I get the sense from the trailer that's going like, you know, they're not only leaning into it, they seem to have a really good cast. There's really good humor here. There's a sense of finding its own, identifying its own aesthetic sort of sweep and having fun. And this thing actually looks like it'll sort of be a good family-friendly entertainment, Mm -hmm. as well as just being something really, just really enjoyable in its own right. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought it would be saying, boy, I'm looking forward to the Willow thing more than I'm looking forward to more of a Tolkien (laughs) adaptation. But here we goddamn are! That's where I'm sitting with right now. Wow, was this a botch. Was this a botch. I'll stop there. What final things do you guys have to say? (laughs) I'm I'm mad on a number of, of levels. Like mm. I'm mad that no matter how good a lot of the visuals are, which are the one of the only things the show has to recommend it, mm. there's still just somebody pointing at 
the Jackson trilogy and going, I want more of this, please, mm-hmm. instead of a unique take on it. I'm mad that the show was given to two straight white men whose only notability is being like J.J. Abrams, like lap dogs or something. Like what <laughs> even is going on there? I like you could have given it to anybody me really you like, could have given it to me <laughs> give it give it to a woman give it to a person of color give it to a woman of color give it give it to other people who have experience creating a story and not just like a failed star trek script or whatever it was mm. and i'm also mad this is a little more meta but i'm mad that because the show was so careful to put women and people of color in the like on its face like you mm-hmm. know all these black actresses or whatever that when you a, a large portion of whatever show, what are the fan bases the show has, are now taking it. So, like, if you criticize this, you must not want diverse fantasy. Yeah. You must not want feminist fantasy. You must not understand women because you don't like the moment where Gladiator's on a horse. That kind of thing, where Amazon, who clearly doesn't give a shit about mm-hmm. anybody, um, <laughs> it feels very like a cynical deployment of diversity, yes. where now you have a built-in section of very vocal fans, potential fans, I suppose, who are going to do their work for them Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. yelling at criticism of the show because doing like heavy air quotes diversity when behind the scenes it's not really diverse it's like mostly white people i think like jennifer hutchison and maybe one other woman i don't know it's just like being maneuvered into that position of like if you hate it you must be some kind of conservative troll is Mm -hmm. like I resent that so much. And it's not, mm-hmm. I mean, this is like conspiracy brain talking when I'm like, Amazon is like only added diversity so that they could be safe from some kinds of criticism is like, but that's kind of how it feels sometimes. And it feels like a lot of people are going along with it. When, I mean, when anybody's talking about it at all, which again, like even the people that I, that I know who like it aren't really posting about it. They're not Mm-mm. talking about it. Nobody Mm-mm. is interested mm-hmm. in talking about it except for being like okay time to watch and then like maybe post a, a gif of some right. really bullshit inspiring speech about the sh- the the light is always there behind the shadow or whatever the sea like, is always right the sea is always- <gasps> oh my god <laughs> sorry to, sorry i was trying to, to wrap up the episode that, i realized but i'm but- <laughs> not bothered by that the way you two are so <laughs> uh, anyway I'm just I'm just mad about all of the things that it has done wrong, and I'm also mad about the few things that it did right because mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. are being negated by everything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they're either like on a story level, they're not being set up or not being followed up on, or on a meta level, like actually hiring a lot of really good actors of color. It's like uh, this feels like a like a shield against criticism to me at this point. Even though they're all fantastic, mm-hmm. like I love they're all great, but still. This kind of, uh, I don't know. So I'm just mad. I'm mad. <laughs> All right, Ariana, send us out. What do you think? <sighs> well, so, yes, this this was a botch job. And I do want to say, if you have been listening to this episode and you do like the show, love the show, that's great. I'm, yes. I'm genuinely... Don't let us kill your joy. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please you know, if you us. did listen to this, I hope it doesn't kill your joy. But it is good to think about stuff... Uh, Thoughtfully. Yeah, that's a good sentence. Um, (laughs) Think about it thoughtfully. (laughs) Think about it thoughtfully. It is good to... Our criticisms are not stemmed in, oh, but the lore, it's not, Mm -hmm. you know, oh, diversity is bad, because actually one of my biggest issues is that the diversity is not enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it is the four big elves are still the whitest white you've ever seen. (laughs) Like... I really wanted to like this show a lot. Mm -hmm. I I really, truly did. I was like, there is such rich thematic work to be done here, and none of it is in the show. And it's such a shame because there are these beautiful moments, lovely moments. But it is, I feel like the scene of Galadriel slow motion riding across a beach in Numenor is a great metonym for the show in that... (laughs) The, Tell us why you hate women, Oriana. I'm gonna. T- I boy, I just hate 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 my gender. <laughs> <laughs> but it is you get the moment of Galadriel smiling, just a pure joy, and that is a lovely, lovely shot. Was surrounded by about ten minutes. It felt of a shot of the horse's flank. Just just a horse's butt, <laughs> just <laughs> being ridden across a beach somewhere in New Zealand and I think that's the show in general is too much time spent on the horse's butt not enough time on Galadriel's smiling face 
<laughs> the rings of power, everyone. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, it's been a long year waiting on this show, and we finally got through it, but we're not quite through with the year yet. We have one more episode to go. Jared, what are we talking about next time? We're, we're talking about horses' butts. No, <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> talking about horses, actually, in a weird way. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, we, actually. Really. So, yeah, you all knew this was, was coming. Um, it's, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the Two Towers movie coming out, so we're going to talk about Jackson's The Two Towers. Speaking of adaptation that generally gets stuff right. Like, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, you know. We, Except we, we for will... a few huge exceptions. Yeah, they make some bizarre choices in this one, but... Well, Discuss you know, that. We will. We yes. will discuss that. And if you will, we'll also say if you do want sort of a, we're not, we're, we're not, we're not going to be cloning or anything like that. But we do recommend Lindsay Ellis, who again has had some marvelous work on uh, on Tolkien adaptations over the years uh, through her new on the Nebula video site, no longer on YouTube. So yes, you'd have to pay a little money. But her new video uh, out uh, looking as the Jackson films, all three of them as adaptational choices, is well worth it. She also has a good five minutes at the start of the episode explaining why she doesn't like the Amazon series. That was. <laughs> To our soul. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we'll I also say. do. I do want to shout out real quick. There is a YouTube channel called Stories of Old, and that YouTuber uh, does a really excellent breakdown of the pacing issues in the. I think it's episode six, actually, of oh, well, the of Rings of Power, and. It's just some of the really baffling editing choices at play there that articulate something that was really kind of bothering me about mm-hmm. the Numenorians riding in to save the day mm-hmm. for the Southlanders. Um, so, mm-hmm. well, yeah, we, 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 we could vent. Though I'm sure there'll be plenty yeah. of venting about this show as we remember other things in future episodes and things like that all the time. But I think, you know, we're kind of <laughs> we're kind of we're free from having to think about the show actively for a Man, while. I and I think we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're yeah. so relieved. We're so relieved. Do definitely listen to our episode from a year ago that was the legendary episode where i couldn't edit because my arm was broken oh, right. <laughs> and all that. yeah so and we had to do it twice too i think it was just oh what a yes. convoluted yeah. mess but we we got through it all it anyway do do give a if you haven't heard it yet uh, do give a listen to our episode from a year ago on peter jackson's fellowship of the ring as we talk about things there this will be sort of essentially our own sequel to that a year in the making with you know reshoots along the way and all that so we'll have a chance to talk about that and uh, i think we'll do presumably what we did last time uh, we will be concentrating and talking about the theatrical version because uh, mm-hmm. that was a good exercise talking about that since I hadn't seen it in so long and that is the way we all first saw the film so uh, so uh, we'll try and keep that in mind too uh, especially with the original color grading hint hint don't watch mm-hmm. the 4K mm-hmm. we've talked about that okay so uh, anyway uh, so we'll let you go oh. well, one more th- one more oh, yeah. thing go, go right ahead. put it here so it can be edited out if necessary um, just there our sister podcast on the network, um, The Spouter Inn, um, recently did an episode about the Two Towers. Yes. Um, yes. Which was fantastic. And at some point in the future, there should be a bonus episode featuring me Yay! as a Yay! special guest talking about the book, The Two Towers. Yeah, so right. I don't think it's out yet. Um, I don't know when it will be out, but look for it anyway and listen to that podcast because it's great. And I know yeah. Oriana's been in it already. So. Yeah. And uh, Oriana do, did the equivalent of uh, doing the uh, doing the bonus episode for the Spatterin's discussion of Fellowship of the Ring. So we can yep. show them the rings to that one. Uh, you might guess who will be ending up doing the bonus episode for Return of the King when they get to that. Uh, Bring us know. home. So, yeah, 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 some, Ned some is guy. scouring the Shire. <laughs> as I speak. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you for letting it get this uh, sort of like extended primal scream off our chest. Finally, <laughs> we've been sort of like, you know, looking forward to this moment. And now it's like, ah, ah thank you. Really? <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, we have well, more, more to come as it happens. Other news, other things, other things. <laughs> you know, it'll be uh-huh. such a joy. And, uh, and as we go through that. So anyway, so yeah, give yourself a rewatch of Jackson's two towers. You haven't in a while and all that other stuff. And otherwise we will, We'll see you. Well, have a good Thanksgiving. Uh, this is because our next episode will be uh, out after that. And uh, when we, we'll be recording just before it, that episode, and that'll be our last one of the year. And then we have a well-deserved break. We need it. <laughs> so, looking forward. That's one reason why being able to do something like the Two Towers is so nice. is like, <laughs> study everything. We've yep. looked at this tons, tons of times. Yep. This will be easy. <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind of a nice little break. Uh, we like it for that reason. And uh, anyway, we will see you all in a month's time. Until then, we'll talk to you. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options.
Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarieh.